And I would want to start by welcoming you back to Gothenburg. You've been here before, right? Yes, uh, my second time. Your second time, but then you were... First time I'm on time. <laughs> first time you're on time. I was, okay. yeah, I missed uh, half of my first uh, book presentation because of, uh, because the airplane was late. So. Oh. Uh, but now you come straight from Stockholm. Yeah, it's a completely new experience. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're here today to talk about your latest book, Figa, in Swedish, the Figa und Trade. But hopefully the conversation we'll have will be about recurring themes in all your books, starting with Latiablar, in English it's called Southern Scum Go Home. Yeah, that's more like an explanation than a translation, but yeah, that's how it's called. Um, and in 2008, uh, Yugoslavia, my father, that came out. And they all, they're all different, but they're all similar at the same time. So I think we will talk about your writing more than your actual novels or your themes, I think. Um, in different ways, all books dive right into contemporary history on Balkan and in Slovenia. They don't shy away from questions of borders, identity, class, ethnicity, or war. It rather feels like they consist of a sometimes painful obsession with history and the importance of processing and analyzing the recent past in order to mend or heal personal wounds. But it's difficult to talk about history or literature in abstract terms, sometimes. So I thought we could start in a completely different way, by discussing details and the way your books find importance in everyday objects. And maybe pull at the strings that are weaved into your story in an attempt to unravel the way you work with literature. How does that sound? Oh, we'll see how it goes. Not good with details. Okay. <laughs> but starting with Under the Fig Tree, it's a huge novel. It's held together with, by the narrator, Yadram. Uh, he's the storyteller that tries to make sense of his own life by telling the tale of his parents and his grandparents' destinies. And for Yadram, everything starts with the death of his grandfather, Alexander. In one of the first scenes, there's two different kinds of objects that Yadram finds near the body of his dead grandfather. And I would like you to talk a little bit about that if you can. The first one is loads and loads of bookmarks, and the other one is, of course, an empty pill bottle. Uh, yeah, the, the first one is the real objects, uh, because uh, this character of the grandfather is obviously inspired by my own grandfather. And, uh, uh, of course, it's very much fictionalized, but there is somehow his ghost in, in, his, in this book. The fig tree, that is the title of the, the title is actually, when I think about a fig tree, I always think about a fig tree that stands in front of his house. And, and somehow, when, for me, uh, the fig tree opens up the whole world. And, and so, of course, I went, I didn't write the autobiography, I didn't write about my grandfather, but there is a lot of things that are really his, and uh, the bookmarks are definitely his. He was, uh, he was a passionate reader. Uh, I'm not sure if he read when he was younger, but when, when I remember him, I always remember him reading a lot. And he had a, he was actually, he, uh, he was never buying the books because he had, a, his uh, pension was really low, or there weren't any for some period, so he was going to, go to the library and borrowing all the new books, and sometimes he would inform me what's new. Uh, and he would read different books, and they were, all around his apartment. I remember one was in the toilet, uh, one was by the bed, one was in the balcony, and uh, he would read it in different times of day. And he was, of course, 
uh, quite a messy person and that he didn't care about the details, as you say. So he would use anything as a bookmark. Mm -hmm. So you could really find anything inside this. <laughs> Uh, books of his, and uh, uh, so it's it's completely different from what I do. I like the proper bookmark. Uh, I like my books to be really bought and new, and uh, I I like them even when I read when I read them uh, to look like uh, nobody has ever touched them. So I'm. Uh, uh, I'm quite a different reader than he was, but uh, actually there is a scene uh, with the, in the book that is basically what happened, that when um, he died, this guy came to establish he died and the cause of the death and the time of death and uh, the cause of the death, which doesn't matter. So, and then he saw all these books and he said, well, that's a rare sight especially when the man dies. I said, almost never I saw a dead man in a book <laughs> by his bed. Uh, he said, Man, sometimes some woman dies and I can see that she read, uh, reads a lot, but almost never a man. And I remember how my aunt who was there was very proud of saying, Our father, my father was a reader. And I, uh, so, uh, that was actually, I wanted to somehow establish this person uh, as a reader, as, because it's also a part of his loneliness, it's also, has to do something with the loneliness, and uh, of course, then, I, after I established this, then I went into fiction, and then we get to the other object, the reaction which is pure fiction, where uh, there was no bottle when my father died, uh, and there was no suspicion about his death. Uh, because that's what Gadron thinks, that his grandfather is dead and his mother, uh, Vesna, uh, just thinks that his father has passed away of old age and uh, perhaps grief, but Gadron suspects that he's committed suicide. Yeah, and that is the one because he finds this bottle and he thinks he, uh, he did a suicide at age 87, uh, which is of course strange, but uh, people are strange and do strange stuff, so I want to suspect everything. Uh, so yeah, uh, he obsession. It's what I would do if somebody told me that my grandfather did uh, commit a suicide. I would probably start looking into it, finding the reason. Uh, usually in Slovenia we have quite a huge problem with suicide, but even bigger problem about not talking about it. It's a, uh, it's a culture world where they say somebody died and then you hear people whispering that perhaps it was suicide, but it, it's never openly admitted almost. Mm. It's never discussed. It's always like we are, we are afraid that if we say that this person killed himself, uh, we, we would dishonor this person. We would uh, bring even bigger pay, pain to his relatives. And, uh, and I remember one poet who died not so long ago, and his friends and relatives were basically fighting, but not in public, but among each other, whether he committed suicide or not, but on the surface nobody said anything. He just died of very strange death. And uh, so, I, I wanted to write about also this, that it's, it, when it's suicide, it's not just that, it's not over. It's opened so many questions, it's open. You cannot just let it go, it's not just the end of somebody's life. So, 
And the book it's really the opening scene for Yadran's um, Yadran's way of finding out about his own history and his grandfather's history. And he more or less makes up their history. Would you say? Well, uh, every story it's um, that's also one of the ideas of this book that every story is a lie. Uh, when you decide to tell a story, to, for this story to be a story, you have to leave something out. You have to hide something. You have to point out to certain events, bring them out, and to make sense of everything. And life rarely makes a sense. Uh, so when you decide to tell a story about somebody's life, you decide to tell a lie about his life. And of course, when, when uh, Yadran tries to sort of create a story of his life, of his life of his parents and grandparents, sort of writing like his own background, uh, finding why he is where he is, uh, it's obvious a construct. It's obviously a construct. It's uh, even, of course, he's this um, constructing this story from the memories, and memories in itself is a construct. Uh, Would you say that not just only a construct? In many ways, the different stories that he uh, makes up are mirrors of his own life. And the different characters, they behave and do the same kind of things um, and they struggle with the same problems uh, mainly male loneliness I would say yeah and the inability to uh, reach out and to feel well that's a very uh, common problem yeah. in our part of the world and I'm afraid not just in our part of the world it's uh, uh, that uh, Loneliness is actually another thing we rarely discuss, but it's very much present and it's very much, we are trying to hide it, sometimes even uh, before our, ourselves. It's, and uh, sometimes we even don't realize how lonely we are. We think if we are surrounded by people that uh, we are not lonely, but uh, it's very difficult for a person to to understand his own loneliness is, uh, uh, of course, it's, it's simple if somebody is old and alone, but if, like, the main character or some other characters uh, who are surrounded by people, constantly in touch with people, then probably they don't understand that loneliness is their problem. Um, and, of course, when uh, then if you don't know what your problem is then you won't find the, the best solution for the problem and so what Yadra doesn't know what to do is with his his need to get away from it all uh, the need we all feel for freedom I think uh, uh, this book came out actually from a from, let's say, a picture or a scene where I imagine a um, sort of version of myself uh, who ran away from his life, who just left everything behind and went somewhere where nobody knows him and he, he knows nobody and start anew. And uh, it's a very, um, very attractive picture in a way. It's, it's, it opens so many possibilities again. It's like, uh, because when you reach a certain point in your life, you, the biggest choices are already made. It's like, uh, you decided who you're going to marry, who you're going to have kids with, or you are going to have kids, uh, where you're going to live. Of course, you can change a lot of that stuff. But, but uh, in a way, that's very apparent in your different kinds of novels. The first novel is about a teenager growing up in Fujina trying to, uh, he, he's very angry, he's very frustrated with his life. He, he doesn't 
feel like he belongs in the Slovenian culture with his, uh, is it Serbian, Croatian, uh, first book? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, well, it's his, uh, his parents are Serbian, Serbs from Bosnia, yeah. so yeah. It's, and and he tries to um, um, to copy an ideal of an identity that he thinks is the real one with his friends in, in Virginia. And then the second book is about a similar man. He's also grown up in Virginia, but he has roots in, in, in Serbia. His father is a war criminal, and he tries to find out the truth about his father. And he finds out that. He's alive, and he needs answers. Yeah. And, but he's a bit older, but he doesn't have any children, and he's in a in a state of uh, growing up that he needs those kinds of questions. But now here, um, your main character, Yadra, he's a bit older. He has a child. He's three years old. Are you writing autobiographical novels in that sense? Well, if you put it that way. <laughs> uh, Definitely, uh, my main characters are growing, growing up with me. They are like, uh, and in a way, definitely, they are versions of myself. Yeah, and I do believe that all the all the literature, or the bigger part of literature, I mean, it's autobiographical. Not in a way that it not the writers, stories. No. not the stories, but what sh when you sit down to write something. You have yourself, you have your own memories, you have your own feelings, you have your own stories, you have your own world. And you play it. Um, you, you have writers that are just writing down the memories and rearranging them. Uh, you have writers who go, who, who go so far into fiction that they write the uh, same fantasies or something. But, uh, it just a matter how you play with what you have, but in the in essence, is uh, of course, it's you write about what you need to write. And uh, with my first two books, uh, now when I look backwards, I understand that what happened much more. That I didn't understand when it was happening. I was just writing. Uh, but now I know that the first two books was actually was where it was where it just needed to come out from. Because two topics of my first book actually defined me as a person, and actually, and then of course as a writer. Uh, because the first one, it, it speaks about growing up in uh, Slovenia, being non-Slovenia, and having this complex identity, and dealing with this complex identity, finding a place in the world which doesn't really, uh, wants you or just is that, that just not waiting you with open arms and, and um, somehow this was I say both of these books are screens because also the second book is the is talking about the the, the war in Yugoslavia and the dissolvement of the country and then disappearance of the world of my child which is another uh, topic that was really defined Way and how I see the world. It's, I think uh, this experience of war and everything that happened really defines how I look at things now. Even now, it's, whenever I think about something, this is somewhere in between. And I, all my, I think, even my ethics are defined by this experience. Uh, my values. So. I basically needed to write about this. It wasn't really a choice. I thought maybe it's a choice at the time, but now I see it wasn't really a choice because this was just bursting out, especially the first novel. The second was a little more, I was thinking through and finding a way how, but still it was going out. I was just partially made, uh, able to suppress and control what was coming out of me. Uh, and after that, of course, all these topics will follow me. Uh, as I said, uh, 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 there, is, there is a map where my stories take place, and those topics are there on the map already. When I imagine a character and when I put it on the map, 
they are all related to topics because this is me, this is who I am. Uh, I just have to stop you there because it's so interesting. Your novels, um, I mean, you're a film director as well, and you write movie scripts, and you, you talk about stories, but your novels aren't stories in the traditional sense of a beginning, middle, and an end. It's more like emotional essays in your latest book, but the story is the geography and the movement between different places. Well, uh, I would say it's uh, this um, um, world of mine, which in the second book is called Yugoslavia and Moja Vizela, and they often uh, want to talk about Yugoslavia, and I often try to explain how Yugoslavia for me is, is the name of my emotional geography. Mm. Uh, how this is not a real country I'm referring to, but it's my own world. My, that it's um, actually from it's from my memories, from uh, from my feelings, from uh, from my language. It's everything I am, everything that formed me, uh, and uh, this is my world, and uh, I I play with it, and. and the stories, I have special, probably the very special relations for the stories. I'm, I'm, I see myself as a storyteller in a way, but, but at the same time, I'm very critical of the story because if you went through the experience of war, then you know that uh, war in Yugoslavia was a, also a war of stories. Uh, propaganda, and every, every side had its own story, and they were fighting which story will prevail, and they were, of course, getting people for their goals through the stories, uh, medias, uh, and also literature and, and film, everything played a part because one to participate in this uh, mass murdering, uh, this civil war, has to believe one of the three stories. And, and you become, from the, let's say, very early stage of your life, very suspicious of stories. Mm -hmm. you, you would love the story, but still, you know that even the good story can be a bad thing. <laughs> so, and that every story is missing something, and that every story can be a lie. And that it's just the way you tell the story, it can be very manipulating. So, I think with all my books, and I always also play with the story and then try to show how. Uh, story in itself is not something necessarily positive and then how you must always doubt your story even as a writer I almost doubt my story and of course Yadran tells almost a perfect story of his life of course then discover that it's of course it's a construct it's a yeah. lie uh, that it's full of uh, but it's your way of, um, of uh, resisting the, the huge the larger false stories by going into um, individuals and, and trying to tell their stories from their perspective. It feels like that in, in well, victory. Well, that was... Like uh, deeply personal stories. Yeah, well, that's... I know how stories change from perspective from the perspective, how the same story can be told and seen by different people, how even the most simpler things can be seen completely differently. That's, I think, the heritage we got from the world we, I grew up in. Uh, and then it's one uh, very personal experience uh, where when I realized how memory can, uh, can be a very tricky thing. Uh, there was one very tragic moment when I was, I don't know, about 12, 13 years old. There was a car accident near my home. Uh, where one, uh, one ten years boy died. And I, I was passing by and I saw his body lying on the, on the street. And um, I don't, I'm not sure what happened next because I have two stories in my head which I don't know which one is, is true or lie. I know that both of them cannot be happening because they are just horrible. <laughs> I cannot be in two places at the same time. Uh, but they are both, when I, I have these 
very strong pictures, and I don't know which one I made up and which one is actually true, or are they both made up? Or, uh, so you can see how mind is very tricky, how you basically, uh, I see a memory and basically you sometimes you remember the story you told about the event, and not the event itself. Uh, you have some pictures which are probably true, but then you artificially connected those pic pictures into some sort of logic. And it doesn't mean that that you forgot what was in between, which pictures were are missed, you don't know. So it's constantly whatever story you want to tell from the memory, it's fiction. So to say that uh, Knausgaard is not writing a fiction because he writes about his life is completely false. Yeah. So and that's for me that's uh, there where it gets interesting uh, because you know it, uh, as I see. It doesn't matter if you write what you remember or you um, just invent things. It's 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 the same process. I think. To me, that's what's the where it's the intensity of uh, Figa lies, and suddenly realizing, oh, I thought about this the wrong way. It wasn't like I expected. Uh, when you when you get another perspective, but it's also one of the things that makes it hard to to summarize the novel. I mean, there's so many stories. There's, there's Alexander and Jana, they meet in the 50s, uh, and they build a house in Croatia, in Momjan, the small village. Then there's the next generation, their daughter, Vesna, and her husband, Safet, who's uh, of Bosnian heritage, but he's not born in Bosnia. And then there's their child, Jadra, his relationship to Anja, their child, Marco, and tons of aunts, uh, friends, uh, people, and, and they all have different um, parts in the novel. And I wanted to ask you to, to make it a little bit more concrete then, when it comes to details. Could you tell us a little bit about um, two pieces of inflatable objects? There's the inner tube of a tractor tire in Bosnia. Okay. Safet uses it. Okay, yes, to, to flow the yeah. river. Yeah. And then there's, uh, I have to look at my papers now, the name of it. Um, I know what it is, but it's such a, such a great name. Oh. Turbo Maximus. Turbo, no. okay. Turbo Maximus. <laughs> and because I wanted to, now we're, we've been talking about really serious and, and, and difficult issues about memory and identity, but your books are really funny as well. And these are two sad and funny stories. So would you be able to tell? Well, tell uh, yeah. It's, uh, this book is actually, yes, I agree, it's very hard to summarize, but for me, when, when they ask me what's your book about, uh, it's very difficult. I was there, I wanted to write a, a love story. Yeah. And I wrote three love stories. And then, of course, when you, no matter what you write in the Balkans, it's always be about wars and conflicts and uh, uh, disappearance of the world and everything. And, uh, so it's, it, and I saw how people read the book, how we read, what they point out, that it can be read really differently. And, and so I'm always curious so what, what, where do somebody point a finger. So, but you're probably the first one to dig this <laughs> for a, a tractor tire, <laughs> um, which I really had to think, what did I write about this? Okay. Yes, this is, um, well, that's probably the closer uh, image in a book to the main idea, the main, the picture that I talked about, this guy that goes further away from, from his life as possible. Obviously, Safet uh, 
didn't went as far away. He went to back, let's say, home, even though it wasn't his home. But he had he lives his family in he lives his family, and it's of course he's uh, he's one of the erased citizen of in Slovenia. Uh, what does that mean? That's a bar bureaucratic genocide. Actually, Slovenian government in 90. Uh, 1991 or 92, they raised 25,000 people who decided not to uh, apply for Slovenian citizenship after Slovenia gained independence. They were they wanted to stay living in Slovenia, being Serbs, Albanians, Bosnians, um, Croatians, uh, and uh, Slovenian government decided to punish them by taking them the rights. Uh, the permit to to live in Slovenia, to take so a lot of them do, lost their jobs, uh, lost their insurances, uh, lost their pensions, uh, funds, um, and of course, it, this created twenty five thousand different stories because it it wasn't really systematic. It was different from city to city, from country to country sometimes. Depends who you knew, how your problems will be solved. So people react very differently. Some of them even moved out and didn't know they were erased. So you, you have from tragic story with that with suicides to people who were expelled um, and to people who um, suffered is one of them. And I uh, saw himself as a defeated mm -hmm. by this kind of policy politics. He was he was a guy who was always winning these small games against the system. Mm. Because in Yugoslavia, people are always in a little game against the system. You had to always play to get what you want. It wasn't just given, it was a little bit more complicated. And, and some people, uh, like my father, like you can think they enjoyed playing in the system and winning these small, small battles. They were losing in general, but they were winning in everyday battles. Uh, uh, on the different offices and uh, sort of, and uh, this is a very proud man who suddenly ends up without his personal documents and his first time really defeated and he's very ashamed and because he comes from the very uh, the society where men are not supposed to be ashamed as defeated or very strong and winning he doesn't know how to handle it and he leaves. And, uh, he actually he doesn't leave very willingly. He ends up fighting the police officer, and they take him out of the country. But he doesn't try to go back because this is just his defeat gets bigger and bigger. And then he runs away actually from everything. Mm -hmm. And in the big, he comes to Bosnia when the war starts, and he comes as a stranger because he had relatives in Bosnia, but he never lived there because he was the, the, his father worked for the army and they were moving around the country. And so he's a complete stranger in a country that's on the verge of war. So, uh, and he doesn't want to have anything to do with it. He have, doesn't have that want to, do, to have anything to do with anyone. He doesn't want to be asked questions. He doesn't want to talk about his defeat mm -hmm. because he doesn't, want, he doesn't know how to deal with it. So he, at the end, uh, he ends up in an old house of his grandmother and as a, as a peak of his new isolation, he takes the truck, sits down and like floats through the river while the shots are heard. And, and I, this, it's the start of the war, right? I mean, yeah, the yeah. war just starts and then he's just in the middle of this beautiful, really, Una River is really amazing, beautiful river. Um, I was, uh, I, I wanted to put it there because it's really, if you think of it, if you know the place, when you think about it, it's really the best place you can do this kind of thing. So you really, on the surface, you have the guy who's really have the best time of his life because so just rafting on Luna River is really mm -hmm. something spectacular. But not when you're in a state of mind of suffering and the war is starting. 
so it's this bizarre sadness in this scene and, uh, and it's yeah. funny as well I mean it's yeah, the, the, the absurdity a... of the scene and the, the tragedy is there but, but a grown man who is too afraid to tell his family that he's been deported so he, he rather lets his son and his wife believe that he's gone or missing he's, yeah. and they believe that he's been killed perhaps or, or been drinking too much or yeah. they're terrified but then at the same time, he's just letting go of everything. It's some kind of freedom in it. Yeah, well. well, some kind of freedom and some kind of rebellion, I think. Yeah. Rebellion against the reality. Yeah. It's like, uh, I'm not accepting the reality. You know? it's, like, uh, uh, it's like this absurd uh, of, of uh, I don't, I don't uh, recognize this court. <laughs> Some war criminals were shouting in hard. You know? It's like I don't accept this reality where I'm defeated. One, I, I don't care about my own reality. I'm just here. Mm. Um, and it's in a way, it's, it's something fatalist, Balkan fatalistic uh, in it. Uh, I, mean, I can, I can. It's very, it's, I, uh, it's very difficult to probably explain. But I, I was sort of feeling with him. I can felt his weird mixture of anger and despair and rebellion and uh, and uh, and all hatred towards everything uh, i think it's i think that the, the our states in balkans are in sort of somehow were trapped for years in this kind of situation where they were they, they made themselves believe that they are just victims of yeah. the, this bizarre reality the, the whole world turned against them and I mean all characters, or all, all male characters in your last two books have the same idea of being victims of circumstances and having too much pride 99% uh, of people yeah. in Balkan I would say are yeah. very of them I mean it's one of the biggest yeah. themes I mean, well, Alexa, like, Alexander like, does the same yeah, thing. Yeah, Alexander. because this is, I think, the biggest problem we have, that after the war, everybody felt as a victim, no matter what he or she did during the war, and no matter which role they played, or who they supported, or everybody felt like a victim. And there still is, and if you can have a dialogue, you can talk about things, when on the other side you have a victim to only see himself, himself and his own pain and is persuaded that everybody is against him and uh, when you start, and I have a lot of experience because most of my relatives uh, who were forced to leave their home and move to Serbia during the war uh, we had often tried to make some political conversation they, would, they like to talk about it but as soon as you like start, let's say, fighting, uh, because how are you coming from Slovenia and not be really a part of the war and uh, not feel victims at least, uh, was pretty much different and then we would fight. Uh, and then suddenly they would start, when, like in responding to your arguments, they would bring their own suffering. And you can and the, the dialogue was stopped. There is no way to go uh, beyond that. And somebody say, yes, but I have to leave my home. Well, what do you say to him? Mm. I'm sorry, but it's, it's worse. And, and, and that's, that's the dialogue we have now for 30 years. Mm. But uh, even before, my point is that Alexander, when he goes to Egypt, yeah, he, is, he perhaps lies about why he goes to Egypt. His wounds are from the Second World War yeah. because he has a Jewish background. His mother hides who she is and he becomes another person in order to, to be safe. We love this victimizing of ourselves. We really, somehow we are, I think we are trapped as a, as a, uh, as a 
a person and as a society we are trapped in this victimized constantly. We are, of course, we are we have this history that is blood, but which history is that? But we, really, we persuaded ourselves that our history is the worst history there is, and that we are the biggest uh, the biggest victims of uh, of the historical events. And also, if you look at the in most intimate level, mm -hmm. it's always uh, if you we have so many jokes and about or say stories about men who were left by their uh, women and and almost it, it's always a man who suffer because wife left him mm -hmm. and there's no other question yes but what did you did to her that she left you in the Balkans where there is no divorces uh, how did you force her to do that well, I don't know she just one day she just came and left, and uh, and then everybody has to uh, to to help this guy back on their feet, and it's 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 it's, it's happening on every possible level, I think, and it's, this is why when you think about when I think about men, I see them as these false victims. Mm. Um, it's 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 very very present. In, do you think Yadran is one of those false victims as well? Well, he tends to be. I think he's fighting like the like my all my characters are trying to fight off this feeling. It's because it drags you inside. It's very it's a very attractive position to be a victim, to feel sorry for yourself. And I think all my main characters, as myself in a way, are trying not to be victims, but it's definitely difficult. It's uh, yeah, Arya puts him in in his place and yeah. tells him that he's filled with hatred and, and wounds and he makes up wounds that aren't really there. Yeah, we, but she has another background. Yeah, we all need uh, this uh, outside voice. So. But, but don't you think that there's a question of class as well? I mean, his uh, girlfriend, wife, uh, Anya, comes from a more uh, non-problematic Slovenian family, uh, I would say, a, a richer family. She's had a happy childhood and doesn't struggle with identities the same way as Yaza does. Yeah, but it's uh, but then it's how you how you see it. It's, uh, yeah. If you see it as a problem then it is a problem and uh, yeah Yada tends to see that as a problem and of course it all these things are of course in life they play their role. It's the, also the class. But uh, sometimes we them to uh, make these things look much bigger than they are, especially in Slovenia. Where Slovenia is a very equal society. We don't we uh, we have classes, but they are not really far away as somewhere else. So they are not really vivid so much. It's, uh, uh, so you feel them. The other feel feels them, but. Uh, in a way, it's not impossible to over, overcome these differences in Slovenia. It's, it's, it, the problem is if you are trapped in your own position, if you are unable to step out of your own world. But it's which, hard. It's hard to yeah, step out of your own world. Uh, definitely. If, <coughs> if you picked, especially if you created an image of your own world, uh, which is uh, just intent to keep you like a cell, which what is what we do. We create ourselves an image of the world, which is uh, a sort of a prison, and, and, and then we uh, then we are uh, some sort. And we start to feel trapped by it, and we start to uh, suffer and so on. So it is difficult, and uh, but uh, I think what all my characters try to do is finding a way out of this construct of the world uh, that is created by identity, by the history of the family history, by the relationship. They all try to find a way out of it because in a way I see, of course, I also have my world and I'm, uh, and I think literature is for me maybe the, the way I'm trying to get out of yeah. 
So I put it in literature, I put it in my writings, and then not dealing with it every single day. Uh, I sort of uh, looking for my, I'm sort of fighting for independence from this world of mine. I, but for that, to fight for independence first, I have to establish this world. I have to realize what this world is. Uh, I have to be really honest how, what is my relationship towards it. I have to really write it down to every single detail, so then I can say, okay, this is my role, this is a part of me, this is very important, but that is also me, who are independent, wants to live his own life, in his own terms, do things very differently, and not be owned by this role. And this is something I think is, when you're old enough so you can build your own identity and you can deal with it and you know what your identity is but it's not like you own your identity and not your identity owning you because this is this is something that my characters are trying to figure out from book to book. I know and I think that your books are also trying to get further and further away from the gravitational pull of the, the black hole that is the, the, uh, the downfall of Yugoslavia and the, the wars that follow. But everything comes back to it again and again, but your books are trying to, to go further and further away. Um, but that's, yeah, and we're always returning, as I said yeah. in the beginning of this conversation, it, it, it very much affects how I look at things. It's 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 my uh, it's my values that are. And I always think going back to this place because then then it was decided who are the bad guys and who are the good guys. What are what is good and what is bad? What is right and what is wrong? Everything was decided for my generation. The war. We formed ourselves through relationship towards what happened. Yeah. My, my, my reason for, for beginning this talk with the idea of the details and, and the things happening is because I feel like that's a way of, of at least uh, temporary getting away from, from the bigger pictures, from the war, yeah. from Yugoslavia. Uh, small anecdotes, small pieces of, of physical things uh, that the narrator looks at things about, often when it comes to Yugoslavia, of course, like the history is in this table, but please tell the story about the, the air mattress, because... Oh yeah, the Turbo Maximus, yeah. yeah <laughs> it's very funny. And well, yeah, the Turbo uh, Maximus appeared uh, uh, like on television at one point of our stories, and, uh, of our lives. And of course, uh, for our uh, for our families, uh, uh, it was like, uh, oh look, uh, there is a bed for our relatives where they come visit us. Um, and then for when I was a little bit older, I was like, oh, when we go camping, we don't have to sleep on the floor. So it's it's it was uh, it was a huge thing. Uh, it was, uh, and I was really. And, and it was really part of the uh, part of the imaginary of one one quite a large part of my life. It's every every house had a turbo maximus. You had a, a small one and a big one and everything. And, and of course, uh, uh, I I'm imagining different possibilities how to use Turbo Maximus and one was of course when you're young and uh, you're living with your parents and you have a girlfriend who's also young and who's also living with your uh, here, her parents uh, that there is no really bed you can use together with her let's say and uh, then where Turbo Maximus come to mind and uh, all you need is this place where you put this Turbo Maximus on the floor and of course, uh, I connected this story uh, with this Turbo Maximus with, uh, uh, with the story when a lot of, uh, after the independence, after some years have passed, a lot of uh, 
property that was uh, taken from people from uh, for by the communists started uh, to be returned to the people. So a lot of people got back their old old apartments, houses, land, or just money. Of course, that land uh, uh, was a faculty standing that they couldn't get the land. But so there were lot, suddenly a lot of these uh, uh, empty apartments, and of course, Anya's family is in the book is very rich, and of course they have this apartment that they're getting, and there is an empty apartment. And of course, the other thinks there isn't bad, there is, but there is Turbo Maximus. So he goes and buys a Turbo Maximus just so that he can have a bed for his him and his girlfriend to to have some fun, but then uh, when he finally puts this bed into the apartment, uh, Anna's father appears on the door, and what he sees, his daughter and her new boyfriend, and Turbo Maximus. <laughs> and unfortunately, he's not alone. There's a, there's a guy who, sh who is uh, who's supposed to renovate the apartment with him. So it's... Uh, but the father finds himself very quickly. Yeah. And it's not an autobiographical scene, <laughs> it's never <laughs> happened to me. Uh, but you've had sex before. Uh, I'm not sure if I threw my maximus. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's... Uh, but these kind of embarrassing scenes uh, are just uh, part of growing up in uh, Slovenia, uh, where we all share apartments with our parents. And, uh, and there's lots of scenes like that in this book, yeah. as it is in your first book, um, and in, in, in every book. That's, that's the way you write, the, the tragedy with the comedy. Well, I see life as a tragic comedy. Yeah. It's a tragic, tragic comedy. Comedy, comedy. But perhaps well, it's, it's a mixture of, it's even the, if I think about the most tragical periods in my life, about the most sad ones. It's uh, it's always uh, it's always something funny. Yeah. It's always something uh, that you can laugh after year, for three years. And so it's I believe that really the tragedy the comedy is tragedy plus time. And so after a certain period you can laugh to everything. It's 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 and I love to laugh. I mean, I can be very serious about almost anything. Uh, I have to, it's also a, a matter of perspective, as you mentioned before, I want to have different perspectives, so I always think, okay, how would you look this from a different perspective, so you can laugh to it. You see, there, uh, it's, it's also probably the influence of the film, because you can, you know, in the film, in the film, uh, you can always tell the story as a drama or as a comedy. It's, it, no matter how tragic a story is, it is possible to make a comedy out of it. It's just a, a matter of perspective. So, and uh, I love when these two perspectives get really close together. So you don't know which one, which is which. You think that it's a comedy, but at the same time it's tragedy. I like this moment, and it's very precious, and uh, I'm always working very hard to try to create such a moment in my writing or in films. It's, and of course, it's not very easy, mm. and it's always in, when you do it in films, it's very difficult for actors to do such a, such a scene. It's always it's a matter of really hitting the right note. Uh, I think you're hitting the right notes very often. And the, but the thing is, even though it's co comical and, and tragedy at the same time, uh, the sadness is a bit bigger in this book than in your two first, because the two first are more filled with anger and, and, uh, yeah. and, and humor in that way. But here it's a sadness that comes with resignation sometimes. I mean, the, the, the main character in the end is more like uh, Vlada's father in your, your last book, he believes almost in destiny. Yeah. 
he was destined yeah. to become the one he was. But talking about perspective, we, we only have a few minutes left. Yeah. And talking about tragedy and comedy, um, let's talk a little bit about what's happening right now. I know what uh, my question is, of course, your view on Peter Hanke. Talking about the war, <laughs> talking about the you academy. Have only a few minutes. Yeah. <laughs> question. I have to ask you because you're a Slovenian writer writing yeah. about everything Yugoslavia. What's yeah. your view on Peter Hanke's little well, I was explaining yesterday all day about uh, Peter Hanke, and then yeah. I came home and opened this uh, main Slovenia uh, media, this internet site, which is from the our public knowledge. And the first news was Hanke, and I always supported Yugoslavia or something like that, because we had an interview for this uh, German newspaper. And I said, well, I read what he said about how he believed, how Milosevic's death was the end of Yugoslavia, how he really was for Yugoslavia, and how he fought for Yugoslavia. And I said, well, maybe everything I said today was nonsense. Maybe he was just an idiot. Mm. Uh, because what, if we really believe that Milosevic wanted Yugoslavia to stay, together and then supporting Milosevic meant supporting Yugoslavia. He really believes that in 1919, then God forgives him, he doesn't know what he's doing. Um, yeah, I think, he, uh, but yeah, that wasn't your question because yeah, we have the problem of the Nobel Prize we have to discuss. Well, I must say that um, it's not an easy, question to, to answer and I, I hated most the, the writers who were taking the stuff easily. Yes, he did some things wrong, but let's go on. Uh, it's, I really believe as a person, as a writer, and, uh, I really believe that we should separate the literature from the art, the art from the artist. And, uh, but, it's really, but at the same time you have to admit it's a really difficult thing to do. Uh, I was never able to persuade myself to read Peter Hanke. I was too young, unfortunately, to read him before the war started. And then later, for me, he was already a supporter of Milosevic, and I can't, really can't read anyone. There are a lot of Serbian writers also who supported Milosevic. Some of them also very good, very famous. Uh, so I, I just can't. I, I wish I can because I, in a way, I am curious, and I want to be curious as a reader. I don't want to have prejudice. I would want to read different stuff, but it's stronger than me. I try, but it's stronger. I can't. Maybe I, I wrote once a while ago that probably I will read Hanke after he dies. Mm. That that it's going to be easier for them. It's going to be over. Uh, but uh, but I can. It's very difficult actually for me to separate him from his writing because he wrote about, he wrote, we talked about stories and he supported one of those stories that helped create the war. Uh, he, he legitimized those stories. He was the eminent Western person who helped Serbs believe the Milosevic story because of course, oh, it's, it's not just us, even the, some famous writers are saying the same stuff. So, I know the story is quite well. A lot of my relatives believe in it because it makes Serbs look much better than they really was. It made them live e easier with the, all the sins they committed. It was easier being a Serb to believe such a story. Why it was easier to be Peter Hanke, I don't know. Uh, but he, he, he took a part in the war because the stories were really a huge part of the world. It wasn't innocent what he did. So of course, that doesn't mean his literature is not worth a Nobel Prize, but should we give it to him? I'm not sure, because it's not that his books, his great books, as I believe, I believe people who say his books are really great. Uh, but it's not the books that get yeah, the money. No. <laughs> he gets the money. Yeah, he gets the money to buy 
wine and cigarettes and uh, giving uh, crazy interviews. Uh, so yeah, it's it's very uh, very difficult uh, question to ask. But my biggest problem with this uh, award is that uh, it was awarded the same year when uh, the other recipient of the award was Olga Tukarch. Yeah. And I think it's not fair towards Olga Tukarch, who is one of the greatest writers of our time, to share the prize, or not the prize, but the attention mm -hmm. with Peter Huntke. Uh, it's not just anyone who should share. Now, we all talk about Peter Huntke. We don't talk enough about how great books Olga Tukarch I should have asked that instead. Yeah. yeah. And I, uh, I think it's not fair if, okay, if the Academy decided that, as Alexander Hammond wrote, uh, genocides come and go and the literature is uh, uh, forever, uh, then okay, but they should make this statement next year uh, when there is no other writer to take. Uh, the tension from him. It's, that is my problem because I think uh, they must have predicted that uh, awarding Kantke will create a lot of uh, furious response and it, it, uh, uh, it will start a debate, everybody will debate about him and Milosevic. And of course, in today's media, there is, only, there is not really much space for literature, and then now this space is overtaken by some old things of one crazy Slovenian guy. Uh, Peter Hanke, is, uh, his mother was Slovenian, so yeah, he's in a way Slovenian. Uh, and so that's that's my biggest problem, you know, because really I think uh, today today this world. There is less and less uh, space for really great books like Olga Tokarczyk. And I see Nobel Prize as one of the few instruments to really get how really great books can get attention they need, how it can be uh, screamed to the world, hey, there is some other literature you don't know yet. Uh, because more and more we are actually living in a world where it's very difficult to get to some books that are really great. There's it's so many books, so many authors, so many PR that we are getting lost. And then you not, you're not using one of the rare instruments right if you are not screening now for a year all that the country, all that the country. So, but I'm happy that the main part of this talk was taken off by your books instead of a discussion about Peter Hatke. Maybe we could round it up there and not give it any more space tonight and stay with your books. Uh, it's been very nice talking to you. Yes. Um, okay. And I, so I, I have hope audience enjoyed as well. <laughs> I, I have so many questions. <laughs> but thank you all for listening. Thank you. And you're, you'll be signing your books? Yes. Yeah.